So I realized at one point, um, I may have been communicating something that I did not intend to many of you. And if it applies, then great. If not, but hear me out. Uh, we, we do our best, especially when you're dealing with um, a congregation like ours on, on two campuses. We're about 500, 550 people strong. It's very difficult to do all the care yourself, as you know. You need to pass this through other people. So we've tried to do on both campuses, tried to communicate with you who is caring for the flock, especially when I'm not able to, when I'm not around. And what I told the Harbor City campus last week was, look, we have these wonderful deacons, these wonderful elders, this wonderful pastoral team that I've introduced to you, people that you know of, other pastors on the staff like Pastor Ken, Pastor Ron, uh, Asunta, and there's many others of you that are pastoring and caring for people in this church. But what I, the message I don't want to send, okay, is that I am not here for you. And I realize I may have been sending that message. So let me just be clear. As much as we need to pastor through other leaders, as much as you need to learn to embrace and receive care from the leaders, that the pastoral leaders that God is raising up in this church, you need to learn how to receive care from them. But I don't want you to think that Pastor Ken is not here for you. So if you need to talk to me, if there's an issue that, you know, it just, it's just bugging you, you can always get in touch with me. Okay? You may not be able to call my cell phone directly, but call our church office and tell them I really want to talk to Pastor Ken. And we'll make it happen. Yes? Yes, Pastor. Okay, good church, good church, good church. All right. Good. So um, we're in this series in the book of Ephesians, and we are on the last uh, message. We're actually finally bringing it to a close, and so that's a good thing. And uh, it's been a wonderful journey. We've had uh, our teaching team has done a great job and listened to some of the messages, and it's been fabulous all around. Wouldn't you agree? Have you, have you learned something from the book of Ephesians? Yeah, it's been good. All right. So today, um, I want to start out the last message in this series with the words of Jesus. Because what we're going to be, the topic we're dealing with today has to do with um, spiritual battle. So Jesus says these words in John chapter 10. He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life, and life more abundantly, or life to the full. In my experience, there are at least a couple reasons why... Christians, Christ followers, do not experience what Jesus is talking about here. There are a couple of reasons why Christ followers do not experience the abundant life that Jesus is promising here. The first reason is that I think we misunderstand the true nature of God's call to discipleship. Right? That's the first reason. We don't realize, especially in American, the American style of Christianity, it tends to be a very consumer-based, what can God do for me, right? And we don't realize that when Jesus calls people to follow Him, there is a cost to discipleship. Right? There's a cost to the life of following Jesus. We are called to lay it all down before the Lord, to surrender everything, right? You don't put your hand in the plow and look back and, and be a servant in the kingdom of God, right? Jesus says you've got to count the cost of following me. And so sometimes I think we misunderstand that there's a cost to discipleship. If you're going to walk with God, you, there needs to, it needs to begin with a full surrender to Him and to His rule and reign. Most of us, we just want God to make us feel good. That's the American brand of Christianity. Come to church so I can feel good. The cost of discipleship doesn't... It, the call to discipleship isn't like that. The call to discipleship is come and die. If you lose your life, Jesus says, then you'll find it. That's the idea. So I think one of the reasons we don't experience abundance and the, the abundant life Jesus is talking about is because we misunderstand that there's a cost to discipleship. Now, if we surrender all, if we lay it all down, if we lose our lives so that we might find it, then we begin to taste the abundance, the abundant life. Now, I'm not talking about getting rich, I'm not talking about you know, experiencing material blessings, okay? We're talking about the, the blessings that Paul started out saying that were ours in the book of Ephesians. Every spiritual blessing in Christ is ours. You know what that means? It means you can stop play, praying for blessing. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've counted the cost and you're a disciple, then the blessings are yours. You don't have to pray, God bless me anymore. Because according to Paul in the book of Ephesians, Every spiritual blessing in Christ has been given to us already. So, 
If you're surrendered to Christ, you start to taste those blessings. There's another reason that we don't experience Christ's abundant life. The first reason is we misunderstand the call to discipleship. But even if we get that right, there's another reason, and it's hinted at in this verse. We live, the minute you say yes to Jesus, you've, entered, you've enlisted in a spiritual army. You have begun a spiritual battle on the side of the kingdom of God. When you say yes to Jesus, all of a sudden you have entered a grand or a different kind of world that is at war. And God has appointed you as his children to be a warrior fighting for this abundant life that he's promised. See, when you, before you came to Jesus, none of, the, the enemy didn't have to worry about you. Yeah, you were no threat to him before you came to Christ. Yeah, you were living in his deceptions. But when you began that journey with God, when you laid it all down for Jesus, Satan's power over you was broken. Some of you need to hear this today. When you said yes to Christ, at that moment, God has set you free. By the power of the cross and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ, you are free. Yes. And Satan has no power over you. However, the minute you said yes to Jesus, a target was placed on your back. And the enemy is now out to steal, kill, and destroy as much of your life as he possibly can. Because he hates God. He hates God the Father, Son, and Spirit. And he'll do anything he can to get back at God. And he does that by attacking those who are his children. So, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus has come to give life and what life more abundantly. And that puts you and me who have chosen to follow Christ right in the middle of a spiritual struggle. You've got to fight for the abundant life that Jesus has given you. Let me tell you something. It's going to be a struggle, but it's worth fighting for. So, it's no surprise that at the end of the book of Ephesians, in the passage we're about to read today, it's no surprise that Ephesians ends by describing the Christian life as a spiritual battle and every Christian a warrior. Paul could have left out the verses we're about to read right now. Verses six, uh, chapter 6, verse 10 through 20. He could have left it out of the letter. And he could have ended the letter right after chap chapter 6, verse 9. And you could have just, you know, that this is great. And we probably would not have missed anything if he had taken out verses 10 through 20. But he doesn't. He puts these verses in with great intentionality. And I'll show you how this works. Okay, so we're going to do a little review of the book of Ephesians. Ready? Up to this point in the letter, Paul has been presenting what we call the ideal Christian life. This is the best possible life that you can live as a Christian. He starts with presenting our identity in Christ, versus a chapter 1 and a little bit of 2, right? This is our identity in Jesus. He's, he's, he's telling us, man, as, as a Christian, man, you, you've been uh, the recipient of a great gift of salvation. And not only that, you've been included in the body of Christ. And, and he's saying that you are the objects of God's mercy, and he's poured out his grace upon you, and it's by grace you've been saved, right? This is your identity in Christ. You've been adopted, you've been chosen, and on and on. And then he moves on, and he starts to talk about the unity of the body of Christ. He says this unity is not just a unity of uniformity. Everybody looks the same, talks the same, eats the same food. No, it's a unity of diversity. Not just ethnic and racial diversity, which includes both Jews and Gentiles. This is a diversity of gifts through which God and the people of God can become equipped and brought to maturity, right? Apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, put into place so that, they, that God's people can do the work of the ministry, be equipped for ministry, right? We can all grow up and mature as we speak the truth in love. The unity of the body. Keep the unity of the spirit, Paul says. And then he goes on to say, I want to talk to you about your purity of life. He brings up the issue of personal and corporate purity. Be imitators of God. Remember that one? Live a life of love. Put off the old life and put on the new, which is being created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And then he moves from that segment in chapter 4 and 5 into chapter 6, where he talks about what true community should look like, especially in our family life and in our households. 
He's, you, we all remember that message, remember? Submit to one another out of reverence for God or for Christ. Wives, submit to husbands. Husbands, love your wives. Children, obey your parents. Slaves, obey your masters. Masters, treat your slaves. Or in today's speech, employers, treat your employees in the same way that you would treat Christ. Submit to one another. And then we arrive at chapter 6, verse 10. It's as if Paul is saying, man, I presented you with the ideal, the best scenario possible in terms of how you can live the Christian life. And then he says, but now I'm going to get rid, very real with you, okay? I, I've talked to you about, you know, how, you sh how it should be. But now I'm going I'm I'm to kind of come down to earth for a little bit. I'm going to talk to you about reality, because reality is this ideal life that I've presented to you in the past five chapters, that life is going to come under attack. You're going to have to fight for it, because the enemy is going to attack your identity in Christ. The enemy is going to attack your unity as the body of Christ. The enemy is going to attack your personal and corporate purity of life to try to corrupt it. The enemy is going to try to attack your experience of community and your mutual submission to one another. That's the reality. And so Paul builds everything up to this one moment. In fact, some scholars say, some commentators say, that the section we're about to read in verse 10 is actually a, a loose, creative summary of the whole letter. And it's, like, it's like Paul saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight some of the main themes in my closing here. I'm going to remind you of what I just told you. But I'm going to format this in a call to action. You might call it a, a, a war cry, a call to battle. And so what we're about to read is really the whole point of the book. You ready? So I've set that up for you. Read these words with this in mind. He says, finally, say finally. Finally. Finally, we're at the end, right? <laughs> finally, my brothers and sisters. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Why? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He basically uses a lot of colorful language to describe that there is spiritual darkness that we war against. So he says, therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests, and with this in mind, be alert. Be alert. You know what that means? Wake up! So tell the person next to you, wake up! Wake up! Wake up. All right, wake up. you may need to do that <laughs> at certain points in the service, okay? Wake up! Always be alert. Always keep praying for all the saints. And then he says some words of final greeting, which we won't cover today. So here it is. If you're taking notes, I'm sorry I didn't format the notes for you today, so you can write, you know, get your pencils out and write. The fact that Paul places these words we just read at the end of the letter says to us, at the very least, the primary arena, the primary arena for applying all the truth of Ephesians is the arena of prayer and spiritual warfare. That's the arena. That's where the battle is. And now I want to talk to you about something because I think we misunderstand or we get, how do I say, maybe out of balance a little bit in our understanding of this whole idea of spiritual warfare. So let me give you a few balance points. Ready? I'm not going to put this on the screen. Just write down what is meaningful to you. First, there is a devil. He is real. And my, my sense of how we think about the devil, especially in the Western world, in America and North America, is that the enemy has done a really good job convincing everybody that he doesn't really exist. 
Isn't that right? You know, he exists in the movies, which everybody knows, all those horror flicks and stuff, they're not real. That's just a special effect. So we have this sense that, oh yeah, the devil is not really real, especially in this, this society. The devil is real. However, okay, here we go. the devil is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at one time. And he's not all powerful. Right? Because all the movies you think he is. Isn't that true? He is real, but he's not in everything. There's not a devil in every doorknob. And everything that goes wrong in the world is not, the devil's not necessarily behind it all. Sometimes it's just human failure. It's just human fallenness. See, much of what we say is the devil is just us acting in disobedience. And we all know certain things can you know, go wrong and the enemy can attack and all that. But don't go around rebuking everything, thinking everything that goes wrong in your life has a demon behind it. Okay? That's all I'm saying. Okay. Now, on the other hand, let's not take for granted the devil's ability. We need to have a healthy respect for his experience in battle. You know why? Because frankly, he's been around longer than any of us. And he knows the Bible better than any of us. So, just because you know the Bible doesn't mean, you know, you're going to succeed in the spiritual war. The enemy knows the Bible too. He used the Bible against Jesus. It's not about knowledge of the Bible. It's whether you obey the God of the Bible. Amen. All right, so, while the devil is not everywhere and he's not all powerful like God is, let's not underestimate his power. The second balance point is this. God has already won the ultimate victory. See, the battle that we're fighting is not between God and Satan. Okay? That's like saying, you know, let's, let's, uh, that's like saying, let's, uh, let's uh, put Pastor Tim and, and Manny Pacquiao in the ring. Let's see who wins. <laughs> Everybody knows who's going to win that fight. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Saying that the battle is about God and Satan, no way, man. The enemy doesn't even have a shot against God. Right? The real battle, according to the Gospels, is between Satan and the church that Jesus is founded. That's the real battle that's taking place. And God has already won the ultimate victory. Satan knows he's already a defeated foe. But he's bent on taking out as many of God's people as he possibly can before the ultimate day of defeat. Because Christ is the ultimate victory. And God knows that he's ultimately won the victory. Yet, because God loves us so much, his heart breaks when we get defeated in these skirmishes with the enemy. And, the God, and Satan knows that. And so he's going to do everything he can to take us out. And to lie to us. So we believe those lies and we, we incorporate those lies into our lifestyle and end up destroying ourselves. Even, yes, even as people of God, even as Christians. So, the victory has already been won. And we are given, as Christians, the responsibility by God to enforce the victory that has been won. Because, how many of you know, I, how many, I know some of you live during this time, in uh, in World War II, when World War II ended, remember there's a difference between D-Day, right, the day that the Allies invaded the beach at Normandy, right? It was a strategic battle. Everyone knew that whoever won that battle would win the war. Who won that battle? The Allies won that battle, right? But it wasn't a, until about almost a year later, until V-Day, where the, the, the enemies, the Germans, the Nazis, had finally and fully surrendered. There was a, 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 almost a year of time between the day that determined the outcome of the battle, which was victory for the Allies, and the day the war actually ended. That's similar to how we live. We live in the in-between time between D-Day and V-Day. And guess what? Researchers will tell you that during that almost year between D-Day and V-Day, there were more casualties that were registered in that war, World War II, than at any other season during the war. More people died during that year between D-Day and D-Day. Why is that? 
Because the enemy was not going to go down without a fight. It's the same way with us. We live in a world at war. We live in a spiritual battlefield. And the enemy wants to take us out. And he's going to try to do as much as he can to take us out. Because he knows he's fighting a losing battle. You see? And he gets even more fierce because of it. So we need to be aware. We need to be aware. So Paul starts out by saying, let me show you how to fight the good fight of faith. Because everything I've told you up to this point in the letter is good. That's the ideal Christian life. But now you're going to apply it. And when you try to apply this stuff, you're going to feel like you're in the middle of a battle. And he's going to say, that's because you, you are. So here's some, here's some instruction. You ready? Here's the first thing Paul says. He says, and this is my version of saying, okay? Stand up. Say, stand up. Stand up. Be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power. Yes. It reminds me of God's words to Joshua when God said to Joshua, be strong and of good courage. Don't be afraid, right? This is a battle cry. The Paul says, be strong in the Lord. And the, and the command there really is, is in the uh, in the passive, called the passive present tense, which means the strength in which you need to be strong is not your strength, it's God's strength. And it's present tense, which means this is an ongoing thing. So don't just be strong once. This is the mentality you need to take into every single moment of every single day. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Why? Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of darkness. In other words, here's how I read that. We are not each other's enemy. Do you hear that? We're not ultimately each other's enemy. When people talk to me about the struggles going on in their life, and they talk to me about problems they have in relationships, especially between brothers and sisters in Christ, it's very easy for us to think that my brother, my sister, is now on a different side. Isn't it? And we forget this is a spiritual battle, and there is something, a malevolent force, that is trying to break the unity between us. And we end up sometimes, you know, I call it spiritual friendly fire. You know, in the Gulf War, there was that time uh, when a large number of casualties were due to friendly fire of you know, American soldiers mistaking their own fellow soldiers for the enemy and accidentally shooting or killing them or blowing them up and stuff. And a lot of casualties because of friendly fire. It's the same way I think sometimes in the spiritual life. We need to be careful that as we're trying to live in love towards one another, as we're trying to repair relationships between each other, and by the way, relationships do break down in the body of Christ. Haven't you noticed? It does happen, but in, our, in the process of doing that, we need to be careful we don't end up fighting against each other. We just need to be careful. Because there's more going on than what we see on the surface. And we cannot take for granted the fact that the enemy wants to take us out and break the unity of the Spirit that God has given us away. Yes? Part of the devil's scheme, he says, you know, put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the schemes of the devil. Part of his scheming is to use lies and deception to turn us against one another. And often we're more than willing to cooperate, aren't we? You know, we'll, we'll believe all those critical remarks we hear about another brother or sister in Christ. <gasps> oh, really? Oh, did you see on Facebook? He typed this, this, this. That, oh, really, we check it out. <laughs> and we're quick to believe all these critical things we hear against and about each other. And before we know it, our behavior starts to get affected, right? Yeah, it's true. Oh, I can't be the same kind of person because I know this about him and it's bugging me. What does the Bible say to do? Jesus says that if there's somebody that offends you in the body of Christ, then you go to that person. You don't talk about that person. You go to them and say, brother or sister. Here's what I've been hearing. Help me. Because I'm feeling a little offended by this. And you clear it up one-on-one. -on -one. Because if you don't start with that step of obedience, you know what happens? A fault-finding and a critical spirit will start to grip your heart. And pretty soon you find that everything you look at, everything that that person does is all negative. It's all negative. Whoa, see? I didn't talk about that. Oh, see? Everything you did. Oh, see? And, then, and all of a sudden it's just suspicious. That's not the spirit out of which we, we can love each other. It, this is why God puts 
apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and the body of Christ to prepare us to grow up so we can speak the truth in love. I know this is hard, especially for the Filipino-American context. I get it. I've seen, over the years, I've seen Filipino churches split and split and split over this kind of stuff. Unnecessary. So we can't have that here. Let's not give in to the devil's schemes. Yes? All right. Because the minute you do so, listen. Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. You know what that means? He stands before the throne of God and he says, Did you see what he just did? God, look at your child. He's sinning again. Yeah, doing it again. And you call him your child? He is not living with you. He's accusing. And then what happens is that spirit, when we start to take on and believe that kind of stuff towards each other, we take on that same spirit of accusation and fault finding. And we become the vessel of the enemy to accuse each other. And you may not outright go, you did this. No. But it's a spirit of fault finding, a spirit of accusation. And slowly, the body of Christ <coughs> begins to be destroyed. So we've got to be careful of this. That is one of the devil's schemes. Remember, Jesus said of Satan, he is a liar and the father of all lies. When he lies, he's speaking his native language. And so the number one tactic of the enemy is deception. It's to lie and to make the lie look like truth. You know how he does that? He gives us half truths. Doesn't he? Yeah, it's like, you know, when you come and you feel like you're condemned, when you come in and man, I didn't really do well. Well, the truth is, you didn't do well this week. You sinned. Right? Oh, but I know, yeah, there's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus, but you sinned. Yes, you did. You sure did. And you're living in a lifestyle of sin. Yeah, and you shouldn't be, probably. But the difference is, when it's condemnation, when it's accusation from the enemy, it causes you to run away from God, to run away from God's people, to run away from the church. If it's true conviction, then you'll come to God. You'll run to the Father and say, Father, I've sinned, and I run to your grace. You see? It's the difference. The enemy says, no, I'm going to condemn, I'm going to accuse, so I can push them away from what they really need, which is a community of healing and grace. So, Jesus says, man, be careful. Paul says, be careful, because rarely will the enemy attack out of the open. Man, when you say the enemy's attacking my life, you know most of us how we experience that? Temptation. Right? You know, Pastor, I'm struggling with temptation. The enemy's attacking me, right? Yeah, he does that too. But you know, sometimes he uses even more subtle tactics. He's a master of deception. And so sometimes he uses seduction. He lures you little by little to thinking certain thoughts. He he uses those thoughts to deceive you into error. He manipulates you using guilt. This is why at this church we try hard not to use guilt to motivate people. We try hard not to use fear and intimidation to motivate people. Right? We do our best. But sometimes the enemy gets the best of us and he uses those things to manipulate us. So yeah, he attacks through open temptation, open persecution, but often, often it's more subtle because he's a master of deception. So Paul says, look, I need you to be strong in the Lord. Take your stand. And remember, this verse, this command, is in light of everything he's told us in Ephesians. So when he says, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, he's really saying, remember everything I've told you. Remember your identity in Christ. Remember that unity is a gift that is given to you. Keep it, maintain it. Don't let the enemy take it. Yes? All right, so he says, stand. How do I do that? How do I, how do we stand? He says, well, you got to put on, say, put on, put on the full armor of God. My way of saying that is, suit up. Say, suit up. Yeah. So first he says, stand up. And then he says, suit up, gear up, put on the full armor of God. My kids were um, at VBS this past summer, and it was a different one than, than the surfing one. It was the, the kingdom of VBS, right? And they were singing this song. 
They just love this song, and they'd always sing it. Go stand strong, da 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 da. Stand strong, da 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 da. And then it, there's a part that goes stand strong on the rock that never rolls. And then when my son said, you know, Dad, what's the rock that never rolls? <laughs> and of course, you know, the easiest answer is Jesus, <laughs> because he's the rock that never rolls, right? The reality is, it's the rock that never rolls is, is your obedience to Jesus. You know? He says, stand strong, stand firm, and put on the armor of God. Paul is probably sitting in his jail cell writing this letter, and he's looking at the Roman centurion right outside the jail cell, and he's probably going, ah, oh, I think I've got a nice idea here in terms of how to communicate this. So he's looking at this Roman soldier, how he's all decked out in his armor, and he says, here's how you stand strong. You've got to put on the full armor of God. And notice, he, he, this phrase could mean put on the armor that God himself uh, that is part of God Himself, or put on armor that is the characteristics, certain characteristics of God. Whatever it is, we need God. This is His armor, and here it is. He says, first, put on the belt of truth. So the soldier's belt here is not part of the armor, right? And a Roman soldier, you know, wasn't part of the armor. It was part of the thing that held up, forgive the imagery here, but the belt held up his underwear, okay? That's, that's part of the, you know, what he's talking about. It was the part that kept his undergarment tight and together. Okay? And it was also the part that was attached to holding his sword. So the soldier's belt was necessary to hold that out. And he says, now, put on the belt of what? Truth. There's a couple ways you can see this. Certainly truth is God's revelation to us of himself in Christ. Okay? So put on the truth of God in Christ. And of, of the scriptures. That's in general. However, truth can also be seen in a different light. It can also refer to truth in terms of sincerity and integrity. The idea that we need to be honest and truthful to ourselves, to God, and to others. Because if we start lying to ourselves, refusing to be self-aware, we might just lapse into hypocrisy. So truth is to guard us against hypocrisy. Saying one thing and living a different way. Put on the belt of truth. That's the first thing. The second piece of the armor is, say, the breastplate. Yes. Breastplate of righteousness. Now, some people think, you know, as you can see in the picture here, that the breastplate didn't just cover the front part of your body. It also covered the back. So, he says here, it's the breastplate that covers, just like in a Roman soldier is wearing a breastplate, it covers all the vital organs. Make sure it's protected. He says it's a breastplate of righteousness. Dikaiosine is the word in the Greek. And there's a way, two ways you can take this. It could mean the breastplate of righteousness in terms of your right standing before God. Like Paul uses the word to describe how you're justified and you're made righteous in Christ. Your position before God. That's important, right? You know why? Because the enemy is going to try to attack you in the sense of your identity. We've always talked about this. That he's going to make you think that just because you sinned once, that you're no longer pleasing to God. That you're no longer worthy of God. But the breastplate of righteousness says no matter what, you are in right standing with God through Jesus. Amen? All right, that's one way to take it. The other way to take it is that the righteousness here is right actions. Like Paul says in another letter, he's, he talks about having the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and the left. He's talking about doing the right thing. This is not hard, so, well, it is hard, but in, in, in principle, it's easy. If you want to fight the good fight, if you want to make sure the enemy does not get the upper hand, then in the situations you face in life, do what you know is right. Plain and simple. Act in righteousness. You will be surprised how many believers think that they can win the battle and still compromise. You know, yeah, Pastor, I know that relationship is wrong for me, but man, it feels good when I'm around that person. Do the right thing, man, or gal, sister. If it's unhealthy, then get out of it. Oh, it's harder than you think. I get it. I know, I know I understand. But if you continue living in a sinful relationship, then man, don't expect to experience a whole lot of victory in your relationships. Do the right thing. 
All right, you get it. That's the breastplate of righteousness. It guards our hearts. Then he says, after you take up the breastplate of righteousness, put on or have your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace. I call it gospel boots. That picture is a picture of a Roman soldier's uh, boot. That's what it looked like, kind of. And the idea in designing that boot was to allow the soldier to endure long marches. And then when he went to battle, it would give him a firm stance when he's fighting. So his foot wouldn't slip, wouldn't slide. Nothing would impede his forward progress. So the word here for readiness is hetoimmasia, um, hetoimmasia, which can also mean firmness, firmness. So the way you can interpret this is Paul is saying the gospel of peace gives you a firm stance or footing so you can't slip or trip whenever you're battling the darkness. The other way to say it is this, and this is for many of us, you ready? The readiness of the gospel of peace is your readiness to share the gospel of peace wherever you go. You know, I noticed that when Christians are active in sharing the gospel, when you're active in sharing your faith with other people, you tend to have a more solid foundation. You tend to have a, a, a certainty, a stability about your Christian walk as you share the gospel with those around you. It's true. And you need to be aware of all the opportunities that God gives you to share the gospel. Because it establishes you on a firm footing. That's why in Romans chapter 1, Paul says the, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. Whenever you share the gospel with somebody, you know what you're actually doing? It's an act of war. You are invading the enemy's territory. The enemy doesn't like that because the gospel of peace is the power of God. So tell the person next to you, share the gospel. Share the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> share the gospel with somebody. This week, share your faith. Amen. The next piece of the armor is the shield of faith. Paul says, in addition to all this, take the shield of faith. Paul is not, um, he's not referring to that, you know, we see pictures of uh, those guys who always hold the man with a little round shield, you know, shield that they use. This is not that round shield. It's the shield you stick here. It's the one that covers the whole body. And it wasn't just a defensive weapon, it was an offensive weapon, especially when it was put together with other shields like this. The, the army could move forward and advance and attack with their shields as a protection. So he says, take up the shield of faith. Now listen, the faith that Paul is talking about here is not some, you know, it's just, it's not the power of your own belief. We have a lot of people that put a lot of faith in a lot of things nowadays. It's not the power of positive thinking, okay? It's not, you know, positive energy. Just, you know, come on, man. Look, look at the glass half, half full instead of half empty. It's not just be optimistic about life. That's not the faith he's talking about. Specifically, the faith that protects your spiritual life like a shield is the faith that is rooted in God's faithfulness. That's what he's talking about. What protects us from the evil one is your faithful connection to God and God's faithfulness to us in providing for us and protecting us. And that includes everything from protection, safety, guidance, direction. It's faith, the faithfulness of God in Christ. So, when you put your trust in God's faithfulness, you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of accusation, intimidation, fear, doubt, worry, you name it. Take up the shield of faith. The last piece of the arm, actually the second to the last, is the helmet of salvation. You know what that is? I guess metaphorically, maybe even spiritually, when you put a helmet on, you're protecting what? Your head. Metaphorically, figuratively, when you put the helmet of salvation on, you're protecting your mind. Right? Whenever I do this in practice, and I say, Lord, I put on the helmet of salvation today. This is how I verbally do it. I put on the helmet of salvation today so that my thoughts can be clothed with your deliverance. How many of you know that you, you have tons of thoughts that flow through your mind every day? Some of those thoughts are from you. Some of those thoughts are from the devil. Some of those thoughts are from God. Some of those thoughts are just from the media and the world around you. We have to be discerning on which thoughts we're letting go from our mind to our hearts. Uh, one preacher said it this way, he said, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head. 
but you can keep the birds from build, building a nest in your hair. Many of us we take some of these random thoughts, some of the thoughts we don't even think about, where is this coming from, and we let it build a nest in our head. And from there, it's able to seep into our heart and eventually lead to our behavior. This is why some people, over many years, they have the hardest time changing their behavior because their thought life has, has been bound. And so, you put on the helmet of salvation so that you can discern what are the thoughts that are coming from God and the ones that aren't. Put them out. Guard against them. Say, God, you've already delivered me. I'm going to focus my thought life on your deliverance. And don't let those thoughts remain. Because if you sleep with those thoughts, as the Bible says, they will give birth to sin. So, put on the what? Helmet of the salvation of God's deliverance. And then he says, then you want to take up the sword of the spirit. I used to think that sword was like this big, massive, like, you know, brave heart sword. But this sword that Paul is referring to is actually a much smaller kind of sword. And the word in Greek is referring to a smaller sword. The idea is that the soldier would take this small sword and because it's smaller, he had to be close up to the enemy when he's fighting. So he could look for chinks in the armor and pierce where there was weakness. So the sword of the spirit, he says, this sword is the word of God. The word there is rhema. And in general, rhema, the word for uh, word in the Bible, the way it's used, rhema and lobo, logos. In general, those words are in but here, there's very good evidence that what Paul is talking about is not just is not just the is not just the letter of the Bible. Okay, he's not just saying you know it's not just the, the word of God like the Bible in, that you're reading, but it's more than that. It's a rhema. It's a specific word that the Holy Spirit gives you that's in line with His Scripture. And that it is targeted for the unique circumstance you're facing. That's the sword, the, the rhema, the word that is spoken to that situation in your life. And it is life-giving. It brings healing and deliverance. Like, uh, I remember one time when my grandma was in the hospital. This is before she passed away. Of and um, she was sick with some kind of heart condition. And my, my, my grandma's been sick, you know, most of her life. But the Lord has always healed her. <laughs> And I remember one time she was sharing with me, she was sitting in this hospital room, and her nurse was a spirit-filled Christian. And one morning, the nurse came in, and she, she came in and she said, hi, uh, hi, Sister Thompson, um, I just feel led to pray for you. And so she put her hands on my grandma, and she prayed, and she spoke uh, a couple of scriptures out. She said, Lord, I believe. And then she just proclaimed the word. She said, she said, Grand, um, Sister Thompson, you will live and not die, and your children will rise to call you blessed. That came straight out of the scripture, right? Two, two scriptures put together. <laughs> it was a sword of the Spirit, speaking healing and life to my grandma. She didn't die from that condition. She got better. The Lord healed her. In the same way, the Lord will speak words of swords of the Spirit. He'll give you direct words of the Scripture to speak into your situation. And you need to use them as a sword of the Spirit in those battles. You believe that? Amen. The reason why we don't use this and we don't live this out often, you know why? Is because most of us don't read the Bible. Or we read it, you know, and we don't consistently take it in. But if you will put the Word of God in the Logos, then the Holy Spirit can use what you're putting in as rhema whenever you need it. That's how you fight effectively. Say yes, Pastor. Yeah. Got it? All right. All right. This is my last point. Paul then says, at the very end of this whole passage, he says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Keep praying for all the sins. Here's the point. Everything that he's just said, Paul says, put on all the armor. And then, you know, when you put on armor, you gear up, you're going to battle, right? Paul then 
He says, let me tell you where the battle really is. He says, the battle. Look at it. Five times in three verses, Paul says the word, pray. Where do you think Paul thinks the battle is? It's in prayer. This is huge. Listen. When you put, he's put on the full armor of God. Remember everything that I've told you. Be strong. Stand firm. Where do we do that? In prayer. He says prayer at least four or five times in this passage. He says, pray in the Spirit. He says, pray on all occasions. He says, pray with all kinds of prayer. He says, pray for the advance of the gospel through my life. Prayer is where the battle is fought and won. You win the battle in prayer, and it